Welcome to the Circular Economy Show, this digital broadcast where we'll be exploring the ins and outs of the circular economy is brought to you by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the idea of a circular economy, engage with key stakeholders, and mobilize system solutions at scale. My name is Ashima, and I'll be your host for this episode. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can submit questions throughout the episode. Please do post them in the chat on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever you might be joining us from, and my colleagues behind the cameras will pass them on to me. Today we have a very special episode because this is an episode that's part of the World Circular Economy Forum. The Foundation is an official partner of the World Circular Economy Forum, and this has actually this has been taking place over the last three days. This is the first time that the Forum is being hosted in North America, in Canada, and that's why today's episode is going to focus on the theme of a circular North America. We're going to be sharing some great stories about how the circular economy is emerging in the region, We'll talk about some great progress that's being made, and we'll also take a look at what's next and what's coming from the region. The region plays a critical role in the global transition to a circular economy. Canada, Mexico, and the US account for more than a quarter of global GDP. The region is also an amazing hub for industry, manufacturing, innovation, tech, natural resources. And it's also been estimated that in the US alone, Every year, $10 billion worth of materials enter landfills across the country. You might be a circular economy veteran in North America, or you might be entirely new to this conversation. Either way, we hope that you learn something from this show. I'm going to be joined in the studio in a little bit by two fantastic guests, but we're going to get started firstly by sharing a few of our favorite stories of how circular economy is coming to life across the three countries. Over the last few weeks, my colleagues and I have been having great conversations with four different organizations about their work on the ground. We're going to start off in Chicago, in the Midwest of the US, where we'll be hearing from Jonathan and Elise, and they'll be talking about their work on, on Plot Chicago. I'm Jonathan Pereira. I am the executive director of Plant Chicago. And I'm Elise O'Malley. I am the circular economy and small business manager at Plant Chicago. Our mission is to cultivate local circular economies. We envision a paradigm shift in production, consumption, and waste driven at the local level, generating equity and economic opportunity for all residents. So the way that manifests itself in our programs as a nonprofit, we're, we're heavily program based. We do a lot of education programs, a lot of events bringing people together from doing hands-on workshops to repair clinics, to uh, collaborating on tool swaps, to creating shared use spaces like indoor growing spaces, um, flexible use spaces for people to explore different ways of growing food indoors year round and small business support as well. We're currently operating out of a former Chicago firehouse on the southwest side of Chicago, which we're repurposing to be a center for circular economy programming. So it's really a wonderful space in terms of being very open and meant to be very active for many people to, to come in and interact with different ways of engaging with circular economy. One of the things that we do at the firehouse is you know, working to generate economic activity, local economic activity. So that manifests itself in a, we have a retail space, which um, when you think of when within the context of circular economy has to operate a little bit differently. So prioritizing things like swap options, refill stations, um, pay what you can as well. We're really focusing and prioritiz prioritizing local and small business entrepreneurs as well. We launched our Circular Economy Leaders Network earlier this year. We refer to it as CELN. It was launched earlier this year as a pilot program to support small businesses across Chicago in their circular economy goals. And the network includes 30 small businesses, which span a variety of, business, a variety of industries. The group features farms, restaurants, retailers, and each is committed to implementing circular practices. 
For example, we have retailers like soap companies and food manufacturers working on reducing their packaging, businesses finding outlets for excess produce, as well as options for local ingredient sourcing. At Plant Chicago, we support them in their circular practices by helping to make connections to each other through facilitated networking, introductions, and knowledge sharing. We also offer monthly workshops related to both circular economy work as well as general small business support like tools for marketing and communication, a waste audit demonstration, financial management, and more. Uh, the, the program lasts for a year and will wrap up early next year although we hope many of the businesses will stay connected indefinitely. Our economic activity certainly is not confined to the walls of the building as well. So every Saturday, we spill out into Davis Square Park, which is across the street, and run a farmer's market, which also is highlighting, obviously, local farmers and growers and, um, and beekeepers as well, but local manufacturers of, of body products and things like that. Everybody who is at some level, embracing circularity um, in terms of their growing practices, um, their packaging as well. So the markets are really another way for us, another tool and another way for us to engage small business community and also make local food accessible. I think recognizing that we could create a circular system that is still highly inequitable, um, but really good at, at diverting materials from landfills. Since some vendors are in our farmer's market and in the network, we're able to work really closely with them. And we're currently in the process of developing what we call BYOC, bring your own container operations at our farmer's market and the firehouse market, which is our on-site retail store. Um, I think the next step, which is really exciting, is taking our pilot indoor victory garden and turning it into a full-blown, um, there's an attached garage to a full-blown indoor victory garden, a shared use space for Chicago residents to learn how to grow food year round um, inside. So it will be an indoor farm and each user of the space will have their own plots, whether they're growing food for themselves or their family or selling a little bit of food to make a little bit of extra revenue. That's what we're, uh, we're really excited about. That was a great example of how an organization is actually engaging communities around it, whether that's local residents or small businesses. And I really love how they're actually taking circular economy models and putting them into practice, whether that's repair or swap shops or, um, again, engaging businesses that are experimenting with these models. The next video is going to take us further south to Guadalajara in Mexico, where we're going to hear from one of the co-founders of a company called Deserto. Hi, my name is Adrián López Velarde, and I'm the co-founder of Deserto, a cactus-based alternative to leather made here in Mexico. Deserto is a cactus-based material that we have developed to mimic the performance and the aesthetics of leather or synthetic leather, but with the advantages of relying on plants rather than chemicals. So here you can see several examples of the colors and textures that we have developed through these two years of uh, presence in the market. And we really work with uh, organic pigments and the chlorophyll of cactus, which of course is green. So it is a challenge to achieve the colors, but it is possible and in a green way. So the Certo is a plant-based alternative to leather and plastics like PVC or polyurethane. And the reason why the Certo is a solution to reduce the carbon footprint of the industry is because we all know that most of the leather tan worldwide involves the use of toxic chemicals like chrome and many other uh, heavy metals. In the plastics world, we also find fossil fuels and chemicals besides making the materials non-biodegradable. So with the Certo, we develop a solution that is made of a cactus, which we of course know that does not require water, no herbicides, no pesticides. It doesn't require any type of chemistry from the ground. And that's very important to, to pay attention to because when we do the life cycle assessment, we are not only 
restoring the properties of soil, but we are also reforesting, absorbing carbon dioxide, making up material that is highly biodegradable. It is clean. It doesn't have any of these toxic chemicals. So you don't have to sacrifice performance and aesthetics for sustainability. Technology has evolved to a point in which uh, we can rely on, on sustainable alternatives. So the benefits of using cactus to make an alternative to animal leather and synthetic materials is not only that we are able to replace uh, fossil fuels and chemicals with plant-based formulations, but we also in in our work as an incentive in the agricultural sector in which we offer uh, a pool of work for the farmers in which they are benefit uh, in, in a very important way. Just to give you an example, if you go to the supermarket and you want to buy a kilogram of cactus for human consumption, the farmer um, is only getting about uh, five pesos, which is less than half a dollar. And uh, what we pay to the farmers instead is as much as 10 US dollars per kilogram. So the economic benefit for them, it's large. Since our launch in October 2019, we have grown our network and our customer base. Uh, we now export 90% of our production worldwide uh, to more than 100 countries. Some of our most iconic collaborations out there in the uh, fashion industry um, are with H&M, Karl Lagerfeld, Fossil, uh, we are working towards uh, the automotive industry as well with very promising and exciting products coming very soon. And so um, that's where we are at. And our next steps are to, to establish our branch offices overseas to deliver a better service to everyone around the world. I can't wait to see what comes next for Deserto. Um, I think they're a great example of how you're using, you can use a locally abundant material that's renewable in, to completely reinvent a product, essentially. We're now off west to trail in British Columbia in Canada, where we're going to hear from Yakimin Van Tonda, who's going to tell us a little bit about Metal Tech Alley. Metal Tech Alley is a marketing strategy for the Lower Columbia Initiatives Corporation. Um, we are situated in trail in British Columbia. Um, I can almost see the US border from my office window. Um, so we're very far south in British Columbia. Uh, we are seven communities that came together for an economic development uh, program here. And that's where Metal Tech Alley started. We are just under 20,000 people altogether that is forming part of this organization or the community. So a few years ago, we decided we need to do something for the sustainability of the area. We are based in a rural area and um, we need to show people what makes us different. We need to show them why they need to come here, live here, start their business here. And we have a unique ecosystem in terms of the industrial circular economy that is already going on here. And we decided that we need to use that um, further expand it and then we can use that as a marketing tool for people to come here, start their business and um, work here. A great example that we do here is, as I said before, we have take metals right in the middle of town that produce lead at um, the plant right here. They use that lead to make car batteries. And then after the lifespan of the car battery, the car battery comes back here and we have KC Recycling that recycles those batteries. Um, lead is the most recycled product in the world and 99% of a car battery gets recycled and we do it right here. So they take the lead and the acid out of the battery that goes then back to tech, which goes back into the system, which then becomes another car battery. And then after six years, that comes back here to get recycled and goes back into the system. So that starts as a linear economy, then closes the loop in a circular economy. 
We also recycle the battery casings of, of the plastic, battery casings of the battery, which also then becomes another battery casing for a car battery, which then comes back here. Um, our goal is to have a whole battery ecosystem here in um, that we will just make the battery here as well and it gets recycled and the product gets uh, produced here, manufactured here as well. So that's a great future product idea that we have is this whole battery ecosystem. We also have a company called Retrieve Technologies. They um, recycle electric vehicle batteries which is a different process to do. Um, they are the only recyclers of um, Tesla batteries in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we do it right here. And what's interesting about them is whatever they extract out of the electric vehicle batteries, they are now working with the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus, as well as other companies like Ego Graphite, Phoenix Advanced Materials to start see if they can uh, produce a new solid state battery. Um, they want to incorporate delirium into a solid state lithium sulfur battery, which means the battery can be much smaller and last much longer before you have to put it, recycle it and put it back into the system. So that's all the exciting stuff. And that's just battery related that's going on here, but there's lots of other stuff going on here in terms of industrial circular economy. Yeah, Kameen definitely alluded to this in the video, but it sounds like there's a lot of potential for an industrial circular economy in North America. The last video we're going to take a look at is um, from California, so we're heading back south, and we're going to hear from another innovative company called Appeal. The main causes of spoilage for fresh fruits and vegetables are desiccation, so water loss, and then oxidation, spoilage on the inside. And what the plastic packaging serves to do is really create a barrier around the fruit that prevents um, water from leaving the fruit and oxygen from getting in. So for a long time, you know, because fruit can be grown and starts to spoil, starts that kind of ripening and spoiling process as soon as it's picked, in order to get it to the shelf and get it to consumers' homes without going bad, we've used tricks like plastic packaging and refrigeration um, in order to get it there without wasting food. So appeal is an alternative. Appeal is a plant-derived coating that's applied to fresh fruits and vegetables after they're harvested. And it does essentially the same thing. It creates this incredibly thin, kind of invisible barrier around the fruit or vegetable that's made of ingredients that are already in the fruits and vegetables that we eat and creates this little extra peel, hence the name appeal, that slows down the water loss and oxidation of the fruit. So the fruits and vegetables end up lasting twice as long as they would without a peel, even you know, without refrigeration. It's intended to be eaten. Um, we say, you know, we're using food to preserve food um, or to protect food. And, you know, here in the U.S., for example, it's um, FDA grass generally recognized as safe and has been approved for use in the EU as well, um, in addition to a lot of other regions throughout the world. So appeal can be applied any time after the produce is picked. What's happening today is we're partnering with large produce packers um, and suppliers where the produce is aggregated and you know, boxed and shipped to retailers and other food distribution channels. And so we design and help install these appeal application systems where our product is mixed in solution with water. So it's a water-based solution sprayed onto the produce and lightly dried before the produce is then sent out um, to retailers and you know, recently um, imperfect produce or imperfect foods here in the U.S. is, is carrying appeal as well. Um, and so yep, it's applied as early in the supply chain as we can when we find those points of aggregation to apply so that the benefits extend throughout the rest of the supply chain. In some instances, you know, with produce that's stored for a long period of time, we can reduce waste even in that storage stage or allow them to think about adjusting maybe the temperature the produce needs to be stored at or loss during, during distribution. Um, we've seen a lot of evidence that it reduces food waste in retail stores on the shelf. 
Um, we've seen 50% on average uh, food waste reduction at retail with our products. And then the benefits extend even to the consumer um, where when you, you know, typically would take the packaging out off or take it out of refrigeration during distribution is when you start to see a lot more of that spoilage. Our product stays with the produce the entire time so that the effect is realized with those downstream stakeholders as well. We've, we've actually been on this road for almost 10 years now from the idea formation all the way through where we're at today with over 500 employees, um, operations in six countries. So it's been a quite a ride. And I think we're, we're just starting to see what this real growth could look like. I'm totally fascinated by the innovation, research and technology behind Appeal. It, it sounds amazing. Um, you might also be interested to know that the company is now worth more than a billion dollars. And they're just one of the many exciting secular startups that are emerging from North America. So, now that we've heard a little bit from different organizations, a few snippets of what's actually going on on the ground, um, and there's much more that we could add to that, whether that's from big corporates or policymakers too, I thought it'd be good to zoom out a little bit and start to explore some bigger questions, like why is collaboration, if it is necessary, at the regional scale in North America for a circular economy? And if we do want collaboration, what form might that take? To help answer some of those questions, I'm now going to be joined by our panelists. We have Armando Yanez from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, and we have Bridget Croak from Closed Loop Partners. So welcome both. Thank you for being here with us today. I thought we'd start off with Armando. Um, before we dig in, I just wanted to get you to share a little bit with the audience about what the Commission for Environmental Cooperation does, how do you work? So just some basic background. Thank you, thank you Ashim, and thank you to all the, the team for, for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here on, on behalf of the, of the Commission. And we are indeed very happy for the invitation and the opportunity to share the panel with you, with Bridget and everyone watching. And, uh, and, and to be part of this important uh, conversation. Uh, the, the CC is uh, an intergovernmental organization. It was established in 1994 as part of the Environmental Cooperation Agreement of North America, which was a parallel negotiation to the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the US. And just recently in 2020, uh, when the new trade agreement was, was signed, the mandate of the commission was not only maintained, but, but even reinforced. So, so since the initial negotiations, the countries had the clear vision that increased trade and cooperation had to go hand in hand with protecting and caring for our environment. And thus the CC. The CC is about the three countries working together to conserve, protect, and enhance the North American environment address environmental issues together, think together, plan together, develop tools and resources that can be used to address these issues and walk the path of sustainability together. So we at the, at the Secretariat of the Commission, we work in close collaboration with, with the party officials as well with a wide range of stakeholders from civil society. Uh, the three countries define our path, our priorities, with advice from the public through the Joint Public Advisory Committee and, and a group on traditional ecological knowledge. And then the Secretariat coordinates multiple stakeholders to carry out the, the projects and initiatives in the different environmental priority topics. Great. That's super helpful background. Um, I was wondering maybe to add to that, could you share with us how circular economy um, actually sits in your agenda and what some of the motivation behind that might be? Certainly. Uh, after the mandate of the commission was confirmed with the new trade agreement in uh, 2020, the countries uh, negotiated uh, uh, the new five-year strategic plan for the commission. And they established uh, circular economy and sustainable materials management as one of the six strategic pillars for our work. 
uh, it's really interesting to, to, to look back at these negotiations because during the negotiations of the strategic plan, the, the, the countries acknowledge that economic growth has placed a high demand on natural resources and that shifting towards sustainable production and consumption patterns is about improving the management and efficient use of materials and resources. So they recognize the importance and the potential of the concepts of circular economy and talked about the many opportunities of working these issues with a, with a regional North American perspective. Uh, so basically they define that CC work should basically do five things. Uh, first, uh, promote a common understanding of the concepts of circular economy across North America. Uh, second, help identify and share information on the measures that have happened in North America, what works, what doesn't work, under what conditions, etc. Uh, third, uh, explore and promote the use of flexible and voluntary mechanisms that are based on the concept of circular economy to protect the environment and foster resource efficiency. Uh, fourth, find ways to enhance the role, this is very important, to enhance the role and engagement of consumers and communities, as well as of the private sector and local governments. We, we are all together in this. Uh, and then uh, finally, support the development of networks and stakeholders across all sectors, including strengthening the existing networks such as, such as this one, which is a great initiative. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, we're just starting the implementation of the strategic plan, but we are certainly looking forward to the, to the work ahead and, and the collaboration with all of you. We, we are also excited uh, to see that the first steps where these goals are, are already here. Just this past week, uh, we had the annual CEC Council session. And in there, the countries confirmed uh, the upcoming CEC projects, which will be of high relevance to the circular economy agenda. And this include work on transforming recycling and waste management in North America, addressing the issue of ghost gear, which is this fishing gear that is left behind, mm -hmm. uh, supply chain transparency. And they confirm also work on, on follow-up projects to our work on, on full loss and waste and hazardous waste. So that's that's and amazing. I'm not sure where we are now. Yeah, and it's it's so encouraging to hear that the three countries are already sort of on this path of working together through your organization on the circular economy. Um, we'll definitely come back to a lot of what you just mentioned, but I wanted to bring in Bridget here now. Um, could you similarly just give us a bit of a glance as to what is Closed Loop Partners doing? How do you actually operate in the region? Um, just so our audience knows where you're coming right. from. Yeah, you got it. Um, and, and again, also same same comments as Armando in terms of being here, really thrilled to be here. Great conversation to be a part of and, and loved seeing the innovation before this. Um, Closed Loop, well, I'm Bridget Croak. I'm a managing director and, and was part of the founding team of Closed Loop Partners, which is an innovation and investment firm working solely to build and scale the circular economy. So that's kind of our, our whole mandate. We have just shy of a half a billion dollars under management. So we're investing on, on the investment arm of our business. We have multiple asset classes that invest to different goals to help support kind of the whole value chain of the circular economy. So we have a venture arm where we are actually just closing our, our second venture fund. Um, we've made you know, almost 20 investments uh, in early stage innovation. Uh, across the supply chain focused on plastics and packaging, uh, food and agriculture, textiles, and supply chain logistics and technology. Um, so those are kind of, that's kind of our scope across the firm. Different funds have different mandates, but the venture fund focuses across all of those, really trying to bring early stage innovation into the world. Um, we're raising a growth equity fund currently, specifically around circular fashion. We have a whole project finance arm where we're investing catalytics. So often kind of below market rate capital in infrastructure that's needed in order to create, um, capture material and turn that hopefully into the feedstock for future uh, packaging and products. And then finally, we have a private equity arm where we're actually making, kind of taking a control stake or acquisition stake um, in companies across um, the recycling supply chain across those, those categories as well, with the goal that we can start to create some vertical and horizontal integration 
in the recovery infrastructure such that we can improve the cost structure of keeping material in circulation. So each fund has a different mandate, kind of different stages um, with a goal of moving companies and, and, and municipal systems kind of through that to scale. At the same time, we have an innovation arm that we call our Center for Circular Economy, where we work pr um, typically pre-competitively across industry and um, the public sector to take kind of specific challenges that may not yet have scaled investment solutions and kind of look at the different levers that we need to pull end to end to be able to solve for particular material challenges from plastic bags to single use cups um, and other challenges, looking at emerging technologies that may not yet be investable and, and kind of building research around that as well. So we're again, very early stage, all the way through the late stage, so focus solely on the circular economy. That's fantastic. Thank you for that helpful background. Um, so now digging into sort of the, the main questions of this panel, Bridget, maybe we'll start with you. I, I'd love to hear from you both on why it's actually important to have the three countries collaborating on the circular economy. Um, Bridget, specifically, you mentioned that a lot of your, um, you, you obviously have investments uh, all over the place. Um, it'd be great to hear from you on whether you can share examples of where it's actually sure. been important to take that regional lens. Um, so anything you have to share yeah. on that would be great. Absolutely. So so maybe I'll kind of focus on a couple of different um, things that I think are the most relevant to consider in terms of regionality and geography. So the first kind of side that we're investing in that requires kind of cross-border thinking is innovation. And the second is looking at kind of how infrastructure works and, and they function pretty differently in terms of how we think about the regionality of those. So on the innovation side, uh, we really look globally at how, you know, with a focus on the end market of North America on innovation. And so like, we're not going to get all of the innovation that we need to solve some of these challenges in the U.S., which is where we're based. We're based in New York. And so that's kind of a primary area. But we have to cross border in, able, in order to identify um, innovation. And frankly, there's different market opportunities that may move faster in different markets. And they, these companies can grow faster, especially in a region um, if they can kind of interact cross borders. So what we'll often do is we work with other investors, other venture funds, growth equity funds that are identifying pipeline. Um, we have co-invested with uh, investors in Mexico and Canada, and we often share pipeline. Um, it's often important to us for, you know, sometimes we'll come in as the lead investor and the US market is what we know the best. So we're, we're gonna, we'll really take kind of the stake there. In other cases, you know, we might be, need the first money out the door, but then at the next raise that a company has, we want, a, we want to see uh, a leader in Mexico or in Canada based on certain market dynamics that will help them grow. So the fact that we're able to both share pipeline and kind of identify innovation across these borders, we can look at what is the real market opportunity for uh, some of these companies. Now on infrastructure, it's a very different dynamic. Infrastructure is very local in terms of how it functions and, and is different region to region. That said, so like what happens in the US because of the regulations and just like consumer dynamics, it's going to have a lot of differences than Canada and Mexico. But at the same time, if you, you look at how material moves and that transport cost, regionality is really important in order to think about the cost structure of keeping materials in circulation. So for example, if you are an upper Midwest state of the US, you have to think about how do I, like, where's the best place for me to, what's the best market for my materials? And oftentimes there's companies in Canada that geographically just make a lot more sense than sending something from like, you know, upper, upper East Coast to Southern California or something like that. So we just can't use these arbitrary borders, especially because supply chains and trade is global and, and certainly because of the trade agreements um, in North America. So all of these are important factors. And so I guess just two quick examples. Um, El Gramo is a refill company that we invested in based in Chile. We co-invested um, in this most recent round. We, we brought them to the US and have piloted them in New York. We feel like there's a huge opportunity in Mexico. The lead investor kind of in the next round came from Mexico. Um, and we're talking to Canadian retailers because the policy environment up there is such that the incentives allow them to move there faster in some cases. So that cross board is really critical. And then from an infrastructure standpoint, 
Um, we've invested in companies in the upper Midwest. So Lakeshore Recycling, which is the fastest growing independent recycler in the greater uh, Chicago kind of mid now Midwestern area. They've gone across, grown across the Great Lakes significantly and their, their ability to be able to access those markets in Canada, which is so close to them, like really improves the economics of their operations and allows them to grow faster. That's fantastic. And thank you for sharing such specific examples where regionality is important. I think that really gives the audience a flavor of why we need to look at North America as a region when we're talking about this stuff. Um, Armando, I'll, I'll come to you now. Obviously, your organization exists because collaboration across the three countries is critical. Um, can you maybe share an example of where the CEC has worked across borders successfully to achieve um, environmental or economic impact in some way? Certainly, and I, I think this is really a, a, a good, important question to, to address. I, I love the Brigitte's answer. Uh, I think that the circular economy is all about uh, waking up to a bigger world, about uh, broadening our scope, our understanding beyond our immediate context understanding how we fit in the big picture, how we are all connected, and, can, and how can, can uh, we help each other to close loops and be more efficient as a, as a whole. So working together makes perfect sense. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it, that's what circular economy is, is, is about. We, we think together, we share experiences, we understand together, we find opportunities, we communicate, we complement each other, we push in the same direction and we build and walk uh, together. And, and that, is, that is actually the, the spirit of, of the CEC for, for North America. The, the CEC has been putting into practice uh, solid collaboration through the implementation of many, many projects over more than 28 years now. And, and, and this regional international collaboration uh, as Brigitte was saying, has many different modalities and makes sense in many different ways. Uh, there are projects where, where uh, the action in one country has a direct impact on what happens in another country. For example, the CC projects on the monarch butterfly. Uh, when Canada and the US plant milkweed along the migratory routes of the monarch, they improve the chances, chances of the monarch to travel to Mexico to make it all the way there, spend winter and reproduce there, and then come back. And when, and, and when she's traveling, she's pollinizing the whole, the whole North, of North America. So that's just uh, amazing. Uh, other type of projects are about uh, coordinating our actions to improve our results to be more efficient, uh, like the CC projects uh, to, to enforce the CITES provisions in trade of endangered species. Uh, where, where we monitor this, this trade uh, of, 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 of the species or the CC projects that, uh, that uh, have been helping the countries to monitor the movement of hazardous waste across the countries. And if we improve this monitoring, uh, we minimize the associated environmental and health risks of, this, of these substances. Uh, and finally, there are also projects where collaboration is about learning together and designing tools and resources to move forward together. Uh, a, a beautiful example of, of this, uh, uh, of solid, efficient, and very productive collaboration with the added value that it was done uh, with the strongly driven by our stakeholders are the, the CEC food, food loss and waste projects. Back in 2015, the, the steering committee for this project designed a very straightforward but very sound strategy to address food loss and waste. Uh, the first stage of the strategy was about understanding the, the issue by exchanging information, best practices, develop a common understanding. So a, a foundational report of food loss and waste in North America was developed, uh, which basically said what food loss and waste meant for North America, what it is, how big it is, why it happens, where it happens. Uh, so we, it, it improved our understanding of the issue. Then a second stage was to develop tools for different stakeholders to address food loss and waste wherever they are in the, in the supply chain. Uh, so a, a, a practical guide on how to measure food loss and waste was developed, aimed at helping organizations of the private sector across the food supply chain to measure 
their own waste and identify opportunities to, to address it. Uh, also, a uh, uh, food matters action kit was developed, uh, target at the education of youth and children to empower them to foster a change from home, to learn the, the, the many little things that they could do at home to address uh, the, the issue and, and, and be part of the solution. Uh, and finally, the third stage was about using and piloting all of the, all of these resources, improve them and promote their use and raise awareness across the region. Uh, I mean, you, I, I invite you to visit our website to to see to see this this work. The, um, yeah, it's really you. worth it, I think. We'll we'll share some of the links in the chat as well. Thank you so much for those examples, Armando. Again, um, both what you you and Bridget shared really show us. Um, why it's important to collaborate in this region and how a lot of collaborations are actually ongoing already. Um, I do want to ask one question and then take one from the audience, so we'll have to keep the responses fairly quick if that's okay. Um, firstly, I, I'd love to take a look at the future. What, knowing that collaboration is important, what's one item on your wish list? If you, you could have something happen in terms of cross-border collaboration, what might the, that be? So, Bridget, do you want to go first quickly? Sure. And as someone who's not a policymaker, I might um, take a policy approach and say, <laughs> easy to do for my lens, uh, that I would love to see the three com governments come together and think about business incentives that they could do cross-border to, um, to incentivize multinational companies that, uh, that sit across all three countries to take more circular approaches. So, um, you know, tax credits, things like that, other things that are kind of incentives that could allow for more collaboration um, and more action on that from some of the big companies, but also to incentivize innovation on this topic. Fantastic, yes, plus one to that. Um, Armando, how about you? One one item on your wish list for cross-border collaboration. Thank you, and I agree with what Bridget said. I think that's important. And I think I think we can think of many of many others. As I told you, these are exciting times, and more and more people are waking up to these concepts and to the importance. Uh, and I think we need to to. To, to, to take advantage of all of this energy. To me, one thing that we should be working on right now is to try to, to find a way to canalize all, all of this energy, to, to define some sort of strategy, a roadmap for, for a circular economy, for, for North America, for, for the world. Uh, and, and it makes perfect sense to be part of this. Uh, it just makes perfect sense to work hand in yeah. hand with all of you. Absolutely. That's a great action item to take forward. Um, I'll wrap up maybe with one question from the audience. So this is from Andros, and who's watching on Facebook. Um, they're asking, how do North American actors learn from the bigger global context, especially in markets that are ahead in the circular economy? This is a World Circular Economy Forum session, so it's only natural to look outwards a little bit. So I'm curious, how are you, your organizations or actors that you're working with, learning from what's happening in other regions as well? I'm happy to jump in. Um, so it's a great question. And obviously, the interconnections go well beyond North America. I think that just the geography of being together in the land masses and kind of the trade agreements to date make a lot of sense. But a lot, we've already seen a lot of the trends on policy and on innovation come from other parts of the world, often Europe, but, but certainly in Asia as well. We're starting to see that more and more. We've seen the risks of moving material from North America into other markets and kind of creating stranded assets of waste um, in other markets that, that create risk here. So like we are inherently international. And I would say that on EPR and policy, First of all, the companies operating in these countries, they have to manage the policies globally. So we just have to deal with the fact that like they're going to have to answer to the strictest geographies. And so it just makes more it makes sense to kind of adopt similar policies that proactively, even if the policy isn't national or international in North America today, mm -hmm. these things are coming and that's going to have to affect business practices. And then kind of to what I've already spoke to, it would be silly of us not to consider the innovation that's happening in other markets and bringing those to North America end markets um, because we just can't expect all of that to happen in this market. 
Great, thank you so much, Bridget. Armando, anything quick to add to that just before we wrap up? How is CEC learning from global other regions? I, I, I asked to what Bridget said. I think it's, it's about learning how to learn, to learn from others, to, to identify everything that is going on and learn those lessons that are already there and, and, and be consistent, be systematic about putting them together and, and, and having that strategy to, to move forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your time and perspectives with us. Um, I certainly feel like I have a clear understanding of what needs to happen next in North America. Um, thank you all for watching today's show and for listening in. And thank you again to our panelists. We will be back next Tuesday at 3 p.m. UK time. That's 10 a.m. Eastern. All the information about the upcoming shows um, are available on our website. And if you have enjoyed the session, please do subscribe to our social media channels so that you'll be informed whenever we go live. Thank you again to our audience for, for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next week.